just waiting for the rest of the team to be ready for the meeting. And they're ready. Okay, super tag, go for it. Okay. We're live. Okay. Uh, this is kind of a random topic. <laughs> enough, it's not uh, uh, directly tied to anything uh, we're doing right now, but uh, I thought it might be of interest. This came up as in conversations with uh, another neuroscientist, and we were talking about covert attention. Um, so I decided to look into it a little bit. So I read a few papers so I could describe a little bit about this particular question that I'm, I was interested in, which is, you know, how does covert attention impact neurons in the in the neocortex um, and I'm hoping you know we haven't talked a lot about covert attention uh, so perhaps this will spur some discussion and uh, perhaps impact uh, some of our thinking on thousand brains theory down the road as well um, but this is meant to be just kind of a general a review of a few papers um, and a few few topics uh, associated with that so before I get into it I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit about what is covert attention. Um, one second, okay. So we've talked a lot about isocods and physical movements and covert attention is the ability to kind of attend internally within our, our brain without any physical movements. So if you think about vision, it would be sort of attending to things without any eye saccades involved. Um, and this seems a little counterintuitive, but this is sort of uh, well-established stuff that I'll talk about a little bit. And in audition, there should be sort of attending to sounds or, or auditory things without any head movements whatsoever. And in somatosensation, somatosensation, this would be sort of attending to feelings in your body without actually moving your body anywhere. So you know, you might try to think about, okay, what is your right foot feeling right at this point in time? And you can attend to that. Um, and at that point, you're kind of, you know, you might be ignoring feelings elsewhere or de-emphasizing uh, feelings elsewhere in your body. And it's kind of a puzzling thing because it's kind of hard to quantify sometimes what, at, what covert attention is. It's hard to think about, but there's thousands of papers on this, uh, literally. Um, so the main categories of uh, covert attention, um, something called spatial covert attention, where you're attending to some location in space, um, you know, such as a particular part of your retina or a particular, um, you know, if it's, if it's auditory attending to a particular location in the physical world outside, um, so on. Then there's something called feature-based attention, which is you're attending to some features of, this, of the sensory input but not specific to a particular location. Um, so this is a, a more global kind of phenomenon. And then there's something called object-based attention, which I'm not gonna uh, talk too much about, um, uh, which is sort of attending to higher level things like objects, but uh, it might actually be very similar to feature-based attention, just at higher levels in the hierarchy potentially. Um, yeah, it's not clear to me that these are actually different. Uh, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about spatial versus feature-based. Um, yeah. In, in some, I think at some level it's not, may not be different, but I'll, I'll I, have, I have a couple of demos to show. Um, okay. So just to kind of highlight this, I put together uh, these two demos. So, um, so first I'll, I'll demo spatial covert attention. So here um, you're supposed to, I, let's see if this actually works over Zoom but you're supposed to attend to the red dot, meaning fixate on the, I'm sorry, you fixate on the red dot. Um, and then what I'm gonna ask you to do, I'm gonna flash some letters out there and try to tell me, it's gonna be a very brief flash and try to tell me what the letter is that's direct, right above the red dot. Not sure okay, if it's gonna work. Uh, I'm gonna try it. Above the red dot. Okay, are you guys ready? Okay, here we go. R. All right. Did anyone see what the letter was above the red dot? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What was it? R. 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 Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Can you tell me all the letters that I presented? No. A R S L M T U O. Oh my God, that's good. <laughs> You're pretty close. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm hoping for most of you the answer is no. Well, I was for... I was gonna I, I was trying to guess what the trick was here, and so There's I was no trick. like, well, no, no, the trick was that I was thinking you're gonna ask me other areas, and so that was the trick. The trick is you asked us <laughs> to tend to one spot, but by so, doing so, I knew that I would miss things in other spots. But I decided to go along with the game, so I tended to right. also. Yeah, so it's, it's not a trick. It's just to point out that clearly, I could have asked you about any location, and you would have been able to tell me about any location. Uh, but you can't tell me about everything in this brief time. So in all cases, the the sensory input is identical. It's just that you are kind of mentally, a, a, based on what I said earlier, you're mentally attending to one location versus other something else. Okay, so here's the. We're supposed to attend to the red dot, right? Or to... uh, no, no, no. So okay, yeah, this is going to get. Um, the literature says it's hard to read because of this fact. So your 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 eyes are fixed on the red dot, but you you're attending to a location without moving your eyes. You keep your eyes straight on the red dot. You think about the location that's directly above. You know, we could we could kind of do this again. So if your your eyes fixed on the red dot. Now maybe look at the location. Think about the location directly below without you, you, moving. You're your not eyes allowed to move your down. eyes. You can't yeah. move your eyes. Yeah, and hopefully at that time you saw there was a U at the bottom there. Okay, so this attentional focus is independent of where you are looking, and this is the main thing with covert attention. So you're always in all of these things. I'll show you the. The animal or the person is fixed on a particular fixation point, but they're attending to different things in the sensory input. Does that make sense, Lucas? Or yeah, but I can still see everything, but maybe just because it's I'm yeah. far away from the screen. Yeah, no, no, you I can still like see. A... Ah, okay, yeah, uh, you're further uh... away. Uh, but yes, you can still see everything. It's just that in certain in the places you're attending, you're your responses are different, you know, like it might be more accurate or. Uh, I think I think it's uh, the effect is less if you're further away from. The yeah, screen. yeah, it's it's definitely easier if you're closer closer in. Um, okay, so that's, and the thing that here is that it was the your attention was focused on a point in space. So I told you ahead of time to look above, not to look to attend above the red dot while looking at the red dot, um, and that's a. That's a location that I'm, I'm telling you to attend to. Okay. So this other one is feature-based covert attention. So here, um, there's going to be a bunch of letters that show up. And the question I want you to think about is, is there a blue letter somewhere on the screen? OK, so again, stay fixated on the red dot. Um, you know, Don't move your eyes. It'll be very brief and just see, OK, Try to answer yes or no. Is there a blue letter on the on the screen? It's going to be very quick. Yes. Uh, just so you know, I, I think we're seeing these frames for much longer than you think we yeah. are. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering that too. Yeah. They're, up for, they're up for several <laughs> seconds. OK, OK. So uh, in my screen, it's up for half a second or less. So that's what with Zoom, who knows, with the internet. Yeah, yeah. Good point, Marcus. Is, this is not a, so I'm glad you told me that. but. Um, uh, anyway, so I hopefully you get the idea. Um, you can. So, did you guys see a blue letter on the screen? Yes. Um, the A, right? The A, yeah. Was there a red letter on the screen? Wait, so. I don't know. The R. Okay, so the answer is no. There was no red letter on the screen. Uh, well, and Lucas, arms, it oh, might be hard for you. It, the yeah. colorblind person, remember? I know. I'm not. Uh, yeah. I, so this is uh, directed at everyone but Lucas. I thought about Lucas oh. as I was doing this. So, um, what color is the R for you? Orange. Uh, it's, it's red in the front. Lucas is colorblind. <laughs> so the, the main point here is that what I asked you to do is based not based on a spatial location. Is based on a quote unquote feature like color. Okay. Um, and so, um, you know, but you could tell it either right away. And I could have put that blue A anywhere on this screen and you would still have noticed it. Um, and, but you didn't notice all the features because you didn't, most of you couldn't tell whether there was a red letter or not. Thanks, so, I'll fix the um, So this is where kind of spatial attention and feature-based 
covert attention are slightly different. One is specific to a location, uh, and the other is specific to quote unquote features. And if you think about locations as features, then they're the same, but otherwise it's, it's different. Um, okay, I'll do one more, which is a slightly more complex one where you can combine some of these things. And the task here, so I'm gonna show you a bunch of rec, uh, sort of oriented bars. Uh, they're gonna be red and green bars, I think. Um, and the idea is to look for a vertical green bar. So if you look on the top right, there's an example of the vertical green bar. I'm saying. And so here again, stay, stay focused. Uh, it's, no, sorry, it's, it's fixate on the black dot. Don't move your eyes. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll flash these things up for me for half a second for you. I don't know how long. And the answer, uh, it's a yes or no question. You know, is there a vertical green bar uh, in the image? Did anyone? It was hard to tell now. Yes, it tell. was on the left. On the, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but so here's, was, yeah. yeah, so here's the stimulus um, here. And, and the thing is here, it's here we're combining two features, the orientation and the color. Uh, and in this case, usually it's much harder to locate it. Whereas if I just did it based on color or orientation, like previously, uh, it's it's much easier to detect it here. It's a little harder. You actually have to, and uh, you know, the, in general, the response time here is linearly dependent on the number of objects that are on the screen. So the idea is that there's some sort of a spotlight um, or searchlight that's there that sort of has to scan and figure out whether both, you know, green and vertical is present at the same time. So some of you just by chance will see it quickly, but in general, this takes the amount of time it takes is not parallel, it's linear um, in the number of objects. And again, in all cases, the eye doesn't move, the eye is fixated on the So I don't want to get, yeah. Yeah. Um, Zoom uh, was, uh, notwithstanding, is it possible to display these things fast enough that a saccade uh, is not possible? But it, I mean, I know there's pre-attentive stuff there, but can these experiments work so that you flash it fast enough that you it's not possible to saccade. Yeah, yeah, so there's a lot of that as well. But, so. you know, but when they do this with trained animals, often with monkeys, the monkey is, is wants a reward, a, a sweet drink. And if the monkey moves its eyes, they can tell. If the monkey does not fixate on the dot, it starts over and the monkey won't get a reward. So when they do this with animals, uh, there's no cheating possible. Yeah, so, there's, uh, so both of those happen so that you have to do eye tracking and case tracking during these experiments, but a lot of times you can also do it fast enough that you couldn't possibly do an isocod. Um, in this kind of a search experiment where you're looking for something, it has it can't be done fast enough uh, just because it takes uh, hundreds of milliseconds to seconds to actually detect the thing. Uh, so there you have to really do the case tracking. Um, so I want to, don't want to belabor this uh, demos uh, too much um, you know, some kind of random things here. So, so analogs to what I've showed you exist in audition and somatosensory domains as well. So it's not specific to vision. Uh, you know, I mentioned this object-based thing and that's basically you can quote unquote attend to high level objects or words, um, you know, such as a name and you hear about like the cocktail party effect, uh, you know, you can hear your name or you, your, you can, ask someone to attend to someone's name and you can hear it um, pretty well in noisy domains than if you, better than if you're not attending to it. Um, and it's pretty fast. Covert attention is much faster than isocads and it usually takes about 75 to 100 milliseconds to switch uh, kind of your covert attention. So if you think about that searchlight example where you have to visually search, it takes roughly this amount of time to go from one, one thing to the next. Um, there's usually a covert attention shift just before an eye saccade. So you can do multiple covert attention shifts per saccade, but um, my recollection is, and I haven't done in-depth thing on this, is that there's almost always a shift to where you're about to uh, saccade to. Uh, I, so my, some, my, my recollection too is if you do, if you're just doing a covert attention, there's 
the, the, the muscles start to, they twitch too. They like, they want to go in that direction, but you're preventing them from. So it, that's the other way around. When you're yeah, out, for, for a long, if you're like really attending for a long period of time, something, you're, you're, uh, it's very hard to prevent an isocot. But in the 100 milli, 75 to 100 milliseconds, you know, you can do multiple covert attention shifts per isocot. No, I guess what I was saying is, I think there was something along the lines of, if I'm, if I'm doing a, a covert attention in different spots, each time I do this, they can detect it. They can detect it in the motor system, or they can detect it in the superior colliculus. It's like it's it's it. There's like a, a certain amount of activity that's it. So they can actually read out which way you're attending by reading those neurons, even okay. though the eye doesn't oh, move. Yeah, that's I, interesting. Yeah. I, it doesn't move, but it's it's like it's really hard not to do it, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's like I think I'm just reinforcing the fact that these two are, are tied together. Yeah, Over yeah. Overt attention, typically. It's, it's interesting how to think about that relationship. Like I mentioned, there's uh, thousands of papers on this topic, and I don't want to go through all of them here. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the vast majority is in the psychophysics literature, kind of similar to the stuff I was showing you earlier, uh, but I was interested in kind of what's known in terms of neural responses and kind of lower level mechanisms. Um, so this is the kind of questions that I was interested in. Um, you know, how does covert attention impact neurons in the neocortex? Um, you know, is it a generic property of cortical areas and perhaps cortical columns? Um, and then kind of broadly, you know, how might it tie into the thousand brains theory? Um, so I don't have answers to all <laughs> definitive answers to any of these, but I'll kind of show you what it, this is a quick review of some of the literature uh, that I found. Okay, so some of the earliest work um, where they actually found a neural, differential neural responses based on spatial attention. This is, goes back to kind of 1985. Um, they found it in V4 and IT. And the experiment here is as follows. So there's a fixation point. Um, let's see if this works. Whoops. Okay, let me see. okay so there's a fixation point there. Okay. Um, and the, the, they're recording from a particular neuron and the neuron has a receptive field here, this dotted line. Um, and within that, this is V4, so the receptive fields are fairly large and they can show kind of multiple stimuli within that receptive field bar and not be very responsive to the vertical bar, as an example. And then the animal is asked to pay attention to either the horizontal bar, as in this case here, or uh, the vertical bar, as in this case here. Okay, um, so, and you can look at the response to the preferred stimulus, which is the horizontal bar, when it's paying attention to it versus that same stimulus when you're not paying attention to it. And basically, uh, what they found here is that attending to an area outside of the response really decrease the response outside the focus. So it's almost like the receptive field is kind of shrinking around where you are uh, paying attention to. So, you know, if you look at uh, the, the left, uh, I'm sorry, the, the right image here, the right case here, um, the response to the horizontal bar there would be s smaller than in this case here. Okay, so it's it's like the receptive field shrinks around where uh, where you're doing, and they calculate a kind of a of how much it it decreases. But you, you know, this is a kind of a histogram of how which which neurons, how many neurons actually decrease, and you can see a lot of them actually dec their response decreased uh, uh, based on the response. Okay, um, here's another example here. Um, so in this case, this is V4 again, but this is with moving stimuli. Um, so what they had is they have four different uh, st stimuli. So if you look at kind of this case here, um, there's four different stimuli that are moving around and the uh, animal is asked to attend to two of them. Okay, so let's say 
it's asked to attend to this one and this one. Okay. And the neuron they're recording form has a receptive field right there. Okay. Um, and then these things start moving around <laughs> and then it's, it will pause at some point like here and this it'll pause inside the receptive field. And the question is now, is this one of the ones you are tending to or is this one of the ones you are not attending to? And you, well, can you look fix, at- Are you fixated during this whole time? You're fixated in all of these experiments. Okay. You're fixated. So you're like fixated at some here. point. You're not showing that point. Yeah, it's it's there. Oh, it's at the little white point. Oh, I see. The and then you're point, trying yeah. to attend to two objects at once. Two objects that are moving around. Yeah. Uh, and two of them are distractors. They're mm -hmm. they're identical looking, but mm -hmm. um, you're not attending to them. And then when the thing pauses, it'll pause. One of those things will be inside the receptive field of the neuron you're recording, and now you can look at um, the response of the neuron based on, is it one of the Thank ones you the you're attending to, or is it one of the ones you're not attending to? Okay. And so basically what they find, um, if you look at kind of this graph here, uh, these are, you can see that if you are attending, which is the dark blue line, your response is higher than if you are not attending. Response, this is a uh, response. What, what neuron are they measuring from here? I mean, you, uh, you, you described a, a cognitive task, like is this, is this object the one you're tracking up? But these are neural responses, so I'm not sure what we're looking at. Yeah, so, if it, if we, so these are all, this is gonna be a neural response to monkey doing the task and the neuron they're recording from has a receptive field right oh there. i see so that's that's the that's the neuron they're recording from yeah uh, okay and okay. in this in this case here they can see they can measure from that neuron and say okay is if this is one of the objects you are attending to what is the response mm -hmm. versus is this an object you are not attending to and what is the got response it. there? got it okay so if and if you look here the dark line is the response response of that neuron if the object was one you were attending to and the light blue line is if you are not attending to it so there's a there's kind of an increase in response it's not huge it's not huge and in a lot of these cases it's about 10 20 10 to 15 percent 20 percent in that range it's not a huge difference um, in this case in this paper though what was interesting is that they also looked at inhibitory neurons so they looked at both excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And the inhibitory neurons are the ones in red here. So these inhibitory neurons are faster firing, they're fast spiking. See that these are the basket cells. Um, and you can see that their increase is actually larger. So the inhibitory neurons had a larger uh, net increase in firing uh, based on attention than uh, if you are not attending to something. So I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, the percentage increase they said was the same, but the magnitude of the increase was, was greater. Mm. And one thing that's been hard for me to find is like what layer these cells are in. Uh, <laughs> uh, this was the only one that gave some clue to it because they're looking at uh, fast spiking basket cells, which are primarily in layer four. Um, so I think this is a recording from layer four, but they didn't say a word about it in that paper, um, unfortunately. Well, if you know what technique they're using that gives you a clue, doesn't give you an answer, but. Yeah, these are electrodes. Most often they would do electrodes in the upper layers. Yeah. I mean, this, it could be layer two, three, because there are some basket cells in layer two. Three, yeah, yeah. Uh, but not many. It, was the paper, uh, were they able to get enough precision on this so that there was a, a phase shift between uh, where the corresponding peaks were between the inhibitory and the uh, excitatory? What do you mean by a phase shift? Well, that the inhibitory uh, fired before the uh, pyramidal cell or? Um, so you can kind of see it on the, on the right here. I don't think they mentioned it. I didn't read the paper closely enough to know that. Um, I mean, to me, it looks almost exactly the, the same. 
if you look at kind of the, the, this vertical line here, if you can see that. But these are typically, these are, these are firing rates here, right? So, so firing these, rates. these are going to be averaged, um, time average signals. And mm. I think you'd lose all the uh, individual spike timing would be lost. Yeah. Over. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. These are these are averaged. I, I was I was just thinking, you know, the things where in new A pulses and stuff like that. But the fact that we we have this model where you know the we can get the inhibitory to fire before the thing. Oh, was ours, in that case, in our case, uh, in in like the temporal memory model, that's really short. Those differences are just a few milliseconds, and. Um, I, I can almost guarantee you that this totally lost in this data. Um, yeah, so the I mean, other thing is averaging, obviously. Yeah, obviously averaging, and, and those bars are separated by a thousand milliseconds. I mean, so you're. Just, yeah, so 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 I think part of the problem is also these are electrode recordings, so they have millisecond level precision, but I think they're only recording from one neuron at a time, so they couldn't necessarily. Oh, too, yeah. You know, you'd have to record from the inhibitory and excitatory at the same time to be able to tell the tell the difference. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the the takeaway from this one is that it's both inhibitory and excitatory cells get affected, and and in this case, they're seeing an increase in their response based on attention. Is there's, there's two epics here? There's a shuffle, a pause, and a shuffle. Yeah, uh, that the sh what, the shuffle what? piece is um, this what? piece here is to make sure the animal is actually doing the task. So they what happens is when these stimuli stop moving, the animal then has to saccade to the ones they were actually attending to, uh, to this, uh, to make sure uh, they're actually tracking it. But what they're actually, what they're really interested in is the response during this period. All right, all right. Yeah, so uh, I kind of ignored the shuffle piece of it. Okay, uh, this one shows, um, Stuff with uh, in MT, uh, you get kind of a, a similar effect. So here, um, there's lots of things to point out with these. But first of all, you know you're fixating up there, so you're not, um, you know, you're not moving your eyes at all. Um, this kind of dotted circle in here, um, that's the receptive field of the neuron you're rec recording from. And then you can put moving dots in either location S1, S2, or S3. And then you can ask the uh, person, in this case, I, no, and they could ask the animal to attend to location S1, S2, or S3. And then you can look at kind of, um, and then they put stimuli at all of these different dotted areas here. Um, and you can let, sort of record the response. And this way you can kind of get a map of, a spatial map of responses. Um, so the probe locations is not where they had a physical probe in the brain. Those are areas which they would light something up. Is that right? I think so. Because in all cases, it's the same neuron that's responding. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you look at panel A, uh, this is how the neuron responds if you are attending to S1. Um, and so you can see that it responds most strongly to stuff moving things that are right at the center of where you're attending. Um, if you look at panel C down below left, uh, this is what happens if you're responding to S2. Uh, I'm sorry, if you're focusing attention on S2, and you can see it responds most strongly to that, uh, to stimuli in that area. Um, and if you look at the difference uh, be, um, yeah, you, you, I think D is you can calculate a difference between that condition and, uh, and A when you're responding, to, uh, when you're focusing on A. You can see that it's uh, the response at location S2 is quite a bit stronger um, than if you were showing the stimulus somewhere else and paying attention, attention there. Okay. And let's see, um, again, keep in mind, this is without any attention, the, uh, res the response of the neuron is, is like in panel B, it's sort of broadly distributed. Okay. 
So this again shows uh, kind of an attentional effect on a particular neuron all within its receptive field without any kind of eye movements going on purely based on kind of task context. Uh, the responses are kind of shrinking in, in specific areas are becoming more, more precise. I'm, so, I'm sorry, what's the difference between B and C again? What was the setup for those? Uh, so C is when you are attending to S2 and you're, you're looking at the response of the cell to stimuli that are presented throughout the receptive field. And it responds most closely if the stimulus is right next to S2. Okay. Uh, that's different from B in what way? And so B is when you're attending to something completely outside. So I think in oh. B, you're actually attending to S3. <clears throat> Got it. Here. Um, and it's just looking at the so it's, so that, you don't that's see this. background. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. And, and D is the delta between C and B? Uh, between A and C, I think. Boy. Okay, so basically, it, there are a lot of. <laughs> basically, the the net result is your your response is much much stronger. The, this neuron's response is quite a bit stronger, at the portion of its receptive field where it's paying attention. So it sort of begs the question of what is the receptive field? Um, you know, attention can completely change what the receptive field of a of a cell is. Um, okay, uh, just there's sort of analogous things with feature-based attention. So here you're not attending to a particular location. Um, in, I, I, I'm sorry, so here, let's say you're, you're fixated on this cross. Okay, right there. Um, the animal is attending to this location but it's asked to tell the difference between dots that are moving here and there, okay, on the left. So I think here it's asked to determine, uh, you know, the speed of one of the directions. So it might be told, hey, look at dots here, which are moving up, uh, and how fast are they moving? Okay, and so, what happens, uh, what they find here is that the response of this cell here, um, which is completely you know, separated from, from this location, um, the overall responses are increased by about uh, 13%. So it's kind of shifted over to the right here. Okay, so, um, so this is a uh, feature-based attention um, and the, the impact is based completely on the feature that you're uh, asked to detect, not on any sort of spatial location. Um, because, you know, you're attending here, you're doing the task here, but the response of this neuron is the one that's uh, impacted. Okay, and it's sort of completely away from the focus of attention. It's purely depend just because you happen to be attending to a particular direction of motion, it kind of enhances the response to the direction of motion, you know, everywhere uh, in, in this, in your visual field. Um, and one more uh, kind of similar thing along those lines, they did the same thing here. Um, and the interesting thing is they found feature-based uh, impact uh, throughout the visual area. So again, this is uh, not, not only is it not local to the spatial location, it's not local to a visual area. It's sort of ubiquitous. So you see impacts in B1, B2, all the way up to uh, MT in this case. Um, they also did this with color. So if you're looking at it for uh, attending to a particular color, um, so it, even away from the focus of attention, uh, you see an increase in the overall response across different brain areas. So uh, basically, you know, the effects are seen everywhere um, throughout different brain areas, motion and color-based effects. And in general, you can see a feature-based attentional effects uh, for lots of different categories, like uh, even orientation and I think depth and other 
quote unquote features as well. Um, and, so this is, and this is not dependent on a, a particular spatial location. Okay, a couple of uh, more things uh, that I found that were kind of interesting. Um, here, they're looking at the impact on synchrony, uh, attention on synchronization. And what they're looking at here, in order to do that, they recorded from a cell. Um, so the cell they're recording from is shown in as a receptive field that's uh, in green there. But they're also recording um, LFP uh, signal right next to that cell. Okay, so they can get both the cell's response as well as kind of general response in that area. And what they find is, in, a, in, in this case, you're fixated here. And so what they, in this case, they uh, found that the, um, the, you know, they didn't find, um, You know, they didn't find a, a huge uh, impact of on firing rate, but what they found is if you look at the frequency of the cells, um, the, the frequency, there was a bump up um, in kind of the, uh, around the 40 to 50 Hertz uh, range. There was an increase in the overall response as a function of attention. And I should mention one important thing is that the distractor objects were quite far from the receptive field here. Uh, you know, they're, they're pretty far from that. But they did see an impact on that. And then they did something interesting, which is they moved the distractor guy much closer. So this distractor is now only a degree or so away. Um, and I think this was in, uh, what did I say? I think this was in V4, I'm not 100% sure. Um, so they moved the, the distractor object much closer, and then they found a much stronger impact of attention. So the, the response rates were much higher to the attended stimulus, and the, res, the overall synchronization was also much higher. Is there, so they, do, they, do they provide theoretical interpretations of this? Very, very rough. Nothing at the level that we think about. I mean, you know, it's just my observation of seeing these papers over the years, and you're right, there's so many of them, is that, you know, they keep getting more and more of these subtle differences and changes, but this, there's, there's almost, at some point, I, my head starts, you know, hurting and trying to keep track of all this stuff. And it's like, you know, there's no consolidation of thinking or no consolidation of ideas or, um, you know, I don't know, I, I don't want to be too critical, but it, it just seems that some, you know, there's a, another study comes out and I can't tell what I really learned, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, he, in this one, the, the reason I kind of uh, thought this was interesting is that um, the effects are, so first of all, it's affecting synchrony and oscillations. So okay. it's yeah. making neurons much more, potentially much more synchronized as a result of so the which, which Which neurons are being synchronized now? Uh, uh, so they're recording LFP here. Uh, so it's the LFP the, recording and the and the cell itself recording. Yeah. And so the LFP shows that kind of in their neighborhood, you're seeing much higher kind of coordinated response around 50 Hertz. Mm, okay. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and the fact that they get a much stronger response when it's very close to the receptive field um, kind of implies to me that attention might be strongest within a cortical column, um, you know. The, how, do you, how do you get that? Because the effect was much weaker when the uh, distractor objects were much further away. Yeah, but, but uh, uh, so. So if you think about a cortical column would have, you know, all the cells within it would be responding to some location in visual space. Yeah. Right. And when, it's only when you get distractors within that region that you start getting stronger effects. So, but but why was that? I mean, so the distractor is a, a, another signal that's contrary to what you're. Uh, I guess I'm, I've lost the yeah, big picture and, here. And, um, yeah. So I think in order, I'm trying to remember exactly. Um, I'm trying to 
trying to remember what the exact task was. So I think. I mean, how does the distractor impact this at all? I mean. Yeah, yeah. So I think you're, I think you're attending to this location. So one case is you're attending to this location, um, but you may have to, I, I, I need to look at the exact paradigm again. Uh, but the but the distractor object does have an impact on the on the overall kind of the you know here the closeness of the distractor object clearly yeah, okay. has an impact on the response. Right. But I don't remember the exact task. All right. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's I can, all right. Um, no, so no, I, these are hard. I remember these are hard studies. These are hard things, and uh, each one you have, there's so many conditions to think. Yeah, I know. About. I know. Um, it is, it's crazy. Just just understanding what the animal had to learn to do sometimes is yeah. impossible. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> I had a, a question. So what's what's the meaning uh, where the uh, it, for, the difference between the previous slide is the local field potential and the uh, receptive field diverged more in this one than the first one? What's the explanation for that? Um, the explanation is that they're much closer in. So here, if you look at the scale bar, one degree is uh, is here, but you know they're, they're, they're kind of uh, they're kind of zooming in on that region. So it's not still one it's still kind of relatively right next to it. That, that this distance didn't change too much. It's just that they shrunk this whole thing down. Okay, but I mean in the other one they uh, one was they almost nearly overlapped in this one they're they're disjoint. So are you saying that when they shrank the, the center of uh, okay. Yeah, uh, so that, okay, fair point. Um, I don't know. I, so first I of all, that, I mean, no, nothing is precise like this, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know where they get these little rounded rectangles from. Um, yeah, this this is a cartoon figure. This is not, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I was just trying to say, was, was there was there something that explained where they uh, uh, the one shifted to, with respect to the other one in response to the distractor or something? Yeah. yeah. I don't even know how they. I, my point, Kevin, is I'm not even sure how they determine where those rectangles go. So it's, you know, they clearly nothing is precise like that. So it's gotta be some sort of average measurement or something that's. That yeah, I think this is just an artist rendering. It's within the noise probably. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm yeah. guessing. Well, I, I just wonder if they had a story to tell around that or whether that's, they just presented it without explanation. That, that yeah. um, I think, I I think the story, much more carefully. the story would have to be, you'd have to first understand how they, how exactly they determine those rectangles. So it's, yeah. it's going to be a, it's going to be a complicated story, whatever it is. And so, uh, kind of just a few more slides. So, kind of getting to your question, Jeff. It's sort of I have kind of the similar feeling. It's really hard to know exactly what's going on, <laughs> and part of it is there's lots of high level models of covert attention. So it's not like there aren't any quote unquote theories, but they're kind of really high level and there's almost no detailed models of the underlying neural mechanisms that people have really tried to figure out. Um, the still really the main one I can find is Crick's uh, hypothesis, um, you know, the searchlight hypothesis where he uh, speculated that the thalamus is, is what's uh, sort of mediating attention and uh, with the TRN or the reticular complex, you have all of these inhibitory neurons here. Um, and these are the, you know, this thing gets feedback from the cortex. Um, it causes some sort of inhibition to happen within the TRN, which in turn affects the, impacts the, the relay cells. And so the, the relay cells themselves are, you know, inhibited or impacted by attention. That's, so what we're seeing in the cortex is really is really a secondary uh, effect. Most of the stuff is actually going on in the thalamus. I think, aren't there some people also have speculated in a very high level way that, you know, it's feedback from higher cortical regions to layer one is also involved in this. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so there's some feed, uh, so some people have speculated that it's feedback related as well. But I think, I believe the typing stuff rules that out, uh, but I'm mm, not 100% sure. Know. Um, so I the, I think this is still kind of the, the best one, uh, theory and it kind of makes sense. Uh, if you remember like the inhibitory neurons were also impacted, um, and these relay cells, they project into layer four to both the inhibitory and the excitatory cells. And so if the, 
if there's some impact of attention down at the relay cell level in the thalamus, uh, this would impact both the inhibitory and the excitatory cells. Mm. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I think this is my last experiment slide. Um, so this is, so I found a paper where they actually tried to look at that and they did see in the LGN, uh, they saw a, an enhanced response uh, in relay cells uh, to when something was attended versus not attended. Mm. Okay. So if you look at, particularly here, if you look at these parvo cells, um, the dash, the solid line is the response when the stimulus is inside the focus of attention and the dotted lines is when it's outside the focus of attention and the response is quite a bit stronger uh, when it's inside the focus of attention. And they actually recorded from the TRN as well. And interestingly, in the TRN, you know, when you're looking at an attentional, when you're inside the focus of attention, the response is weaker. So it's like there's either a disinhibition or there's, you know, inhibition outside the focus of attention. So this is, uh, and this is right in the LGN. So this is the only, you know, cortical feedback here is from L6. Yeah, uh, yeah. So this, this, this is some sense validates Crick's idea to some yeah. level because this, yeah. the, the only, this, no one believes this is happening in the retina. So, um, so if, if you're seeing this in the primary uh, visual thalamus relay cells, then it must be coming from A6 in the V1 or maybe yeah, B2. Yeah. But um, so I thought this yeah. was good. So this is the closest uh, I could see in terms of a real getting towards a real mechanism. Yeah. Um, I, had, I had a question on that the um, my vague recollection of the thalamus, it, 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 those relay cells bounce back and forth uh, discreetly between the various uh, visual cortex layers, right? I mean, V1 has its thalamic re relay and then V2 and, and whatnot. But you showed an experiment where all the levels got, uh, you know, from V1 up to MT, all got uh, affected by this attentional mechanism. I'm just trying to figure out anatomically what structure uh, has that kind of access across the entire visual cortex? Yeah, so the thalamus does, um, but it's it's segregated by area. So, um, you know, if you look at the thalamus here, it's a big picture, but it's split up into different nuclei. And so uh, the LGN here would project to V1. Um, and then there'll be another uh, nucleus here that projects to V2 and another one that projects to V4. So, um, so uh, you know, the thalamus is, that's one of the reasons uh, Crick proposed the thalamus is sort of perfectly positioned uh, to kind of do this. And in addition, um, there's sort of feedback projections. Let's see if I can do this. From V1, there's feedback through the TRN. From V2, there's feedback. Oh, this is getting messy here. <laughs> Um, but from each region, there's feedback to the thalamus from layer six. Um, and so we so accomplish uh, cascade effect to produce that, you know, global phenomena. It's com it's complex, but it's also simple in the sense that the architecture is actually the same across, doesn't matter what the visual area is. Um, you know, this is the, let's see. It's also complex. I mean, there are, there's other yeah, weird it, stuff that's going on. Like like LGN also projects the V2. It's not the prominent one, but it does. Yeah. So V2 gets direct input from the retina and LGN. Um, and so does V4. <laughs> Just yeah. less so. It's it's <laughs> it's really screwy. Um, um uh, but but the, the thing is there is a canonical pattern of, of projections here uh, that are you know seem to be preserved yeah. across. Uh, different regions and across different modalities. So I wrote a blog post on this a while ago. So if you search for thalamus snubbed, you'll find it uh, where uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Murray Sherman and others have sort of articulated uh, and Ray Grillery and others have articulated that they, they figured out kind of the anatomy and a lot of this It's very, very canonical. And we've talked about this a lot in the, in the past in these research groups and mm -hmm. we can kind of revisit this again, but. Yeah, I think if I think about the, the whole picture here, um, what's fascinating to me is, I mean, the covert attention is an interesting piece of the puzzle, but 
but um, but over detention is super important too. Like if I look at a scene and I'm trying to build up a model of the scene and I'm trying to look at where all the different parts of, that I'm seeing are related to each other, it's very clear to me that we attend to individual components one at a time. And as we do, uh, each time we attend to them, and this is usually an over detention, I saccade or move my fingers, or whatever, that each time I do that, I find it's that uh, what, what it is I'm attending to and where it is relative to the other things I just saw. Yeah. So this process of over detention is clearly how we build up a model of the world, um, you know, through search and movement. And then the over detention is sort of like a, it's an interesting twist on it. It's uh, maybe some clues as to mechanisms and stuff. Yeah. So I was thinking, um, so here's kind of my discussion oh, oh, sorry. Uh, points <laughs> sure, here, but uh, <laughs> sure, you, spoke, you should have spoken first and I might not have said something stupid. No, no, but, but this is kind of my question. One sort of talk question, you know, could covert attention be used to figure out relative locations, just like movement. Um, you know, if you're moving around covertly to different locations, you also get some notion. Of, I don't, I don't know. It's interesting because the, the covert attention is, well, as you pointed out, there's different types and um, I know that's, you know, like the feature one we use all the time, clearly, you know, you're in the, mm -hmm. the cocktail room and you're just listening, you just somehow internally doing it, but like the visual, uh, covert attention, I'm not sure how often that really occurs in life. Um, you know, don't well, move your eyes. More, well, uh, you know, playing devil's advocate, it occurs much more often than isocods. Really? That's, yeah. that's, that's yeah. well, it's, 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 it's subconscious, but. We I'm are not sure that's true. Why, why would that be true? Because uh, I think everywhere they've looked, there's always a covert attention shift just before an isocod. Yeah, well, that's 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 true, but that does mean it's more. But, but uh, think, and then I, there are and there are attention shifts that don't are not tied to isocod. Okay, so that, by definition, I, it has to be more than isocod. Well, I'm surprised by that because uh, I I'd like to see the data on that. My my impression is that almost all the attentional shifts we do are are, are overt. And they're always accompanied with a covert attention. It's, it's sort of like the the preamble to the to the real thing. Um, but I'm not aware. You might be right, but I'm not aware of research that shows that um, covert attention is is happening all the time outside of that. Um, to me, they're like that's why that's why I kept, I kept saying I think of covert attention sort of as a at least with the visual scene. I always felt I always felt that it was like a preamble to the real thing. It's like they go hand in hand. It's it's what happens when you're about to saccad anyway. Um, but the idea that you might be doing it all the time, I haven't heard that. Yeah, I think that's true. It is all the time. I, um, I'd, I'd like to see some proof of that. I'm, yeah, I'm I, really could, I could try and find that. You know, some people have said, okay, maybe covert attention is a way to filter out where you are finally going to actually do an isocod to. So mm -hmm. you might look at a couple of different places and say, okay, no, this is really, because isocods are more expensive um, and mm -hmm. they're slower. And so, you know, maybe uh, to, to some that, extent. And you can also do tasks. You can do tasks, you know, clearly without any isocods. You can do all these attentional tasks. Yeah, I know, but but that takes a lot of training to do that. You know, to get an animal to do these experiments, it takes months of training because uh, their natural yeah, inclination there was to move the eyes. I mean, that's everyone wants to move their eyes all the time. <laughs> but I think the general feeling is we're doing this. That's for a specific task that's pretty artificial, but yeah. in kind of general life we're using covert attention constantly to i i agree i things. agree that in the general case i like like i said like you're doing a you know the extracting the feature from a you know like voice someone's voice or looking looking for something if i'm trying to find waldo then i'm doing this obviously but um but i i the, the idea of this uh related to movement like feature attention like is there a blue dot there's no movement associated to find the blue dot there's, that's not a movement related attentional mechanism no um no. But um, to see what's happening in a particular place, I've always felt that that's almost, you know, that's, anyway, I, I'd be surprised. I'm still surprised. I'm, I'm not convinced. I, I was under the impression that all, you know, in vision, it's pretty rare that you do this. Um, but I could be wrong. I don't know. Well, isn't it the case that we're always open to subliminal cues? Well, I don't, Yeah, I but don't that know. doesn't have to be uh, attention-based. So there's yeah. always, like, if there's a bright flash, for example, you know, you're going to uh, attend to it over dark covert, and that's, uh, and there's also, you know, that's purely bottom up and there's subliminal bottom up cues that, uh, you know, we may not be uh, consciously aware of at all. Um, yeah, but subliminal almost... clues does not mean you're not attending to it. It just means it, it, it didn't create enough of activity that you became conscious of it. You, in fact, right. it, it almost means the opposite. A subliminal clue is, is a change 
that wasn't strong enough to cause you to attend to it. <laughs> That's what it the well, yeah, clues. but I mean, I mean, to your point, if if the subliminal cues where they they flash a word up and it doesn't hit your conscious attention, would you saccade to where that thing came up? Or well, usually, what subliminal it means is that that, that uh, I, no, I don't think it would saccade to it. I mean, it's, it's so then it's meaning. by definition be covert, wouldn't it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean you're attending no, no, it to it at all. It could be that there's no attention at there's all. There's no attention at all. It's just a signal that comes in, and, and you didn't attend to it, um, but it has some neural activity. Like an image is presented on the retina, and it's going to create activity. Uh, even a very short image is going to create activity. And the question is, how far does that activity propagate, and what happens? And to me, a lot of the subliminal stuff is it, it wasn't strong enough or it's too fast that your brain didn't even attend to it because it had no knowledge that it, you know, that it didn't, didn't reach some, um, some level of uh, activity that, that, that propagates further. I, I, um, I guess the point I'm trying to make is if, if, that, if, if that mechanism exists, why not at the next level up covert being always present too? I guess I just don't, I, I'm, I'm a little bit confused, Kevin. I don't see, um, I'm not I, don't what, I, don't, I don't even do want this. mechanism. I mean, we don't even, we're talking about subliminal things as, as if there's a well understood thing. Maybe there's a bunch of literature on it. I don't know. Uh, but the general idea of subliminal input means is input that's lower than the limit to see it, to perceive it. It's, it's all it means. And it can have an effect, of course. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't think you can read from that that we're doing, um, uh, covert attention all the time. I, I, I think it's an interesting question, but I don't think you can read into that. Anyway, I, 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 I'd be curious if there's some literature on that. I'm not asking you to go search for it, super time, but uh, I've always kind of put covert attention, at least the type we're talking about here where you're doing spatial covert attention. I've always put that into the, it pair, it's paired with physical movement. Um, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, I don't know. More questions than answers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe I could just summarize the stuff I, yeah. I talked about here. So, um, you know, overall, looks like covert attention enhances responses of neurons within the focus of attention by roughly 15, 20%, and but inhibits responses outside it. Um, both pyramidal and inhibitory cells are impacted. Uh, you know, I, I think this means layer four, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, and responses within the focus of attention show greater synchronization. So it could be a mechanism. It could be either a mechanism or kind of a uh, result of greater synchronization. Um, I think people have argued for that, yeah, that they've argued that um, synchronization is a mechanism for attending. Somebody, somebody argued that once. Yeah, or, that, or it, it could be that synchronization is really the main thing that's happening and attention is kind of this byproduct. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> right, 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 right. Or so that, I, could, I could flip it around too. Or that, that is what it means to, maybe that is what it means to attend to something, it's synchronized, I don't know. Um, you know, it's, it's present in all sensory areas uh, and it's, you know, potentially mediated by the thalamus, via the thalamus. I think that's a pretty solid idea, but... Uh, yeah. Again, there's, there's more work to be done. Um, you know, again, I was speculating the impact might be greater within a cortical column. Um, just the inhibition seems to be greater and the, the synchrony effects seem to be greater, you know, nearby in a sensory area. But again, I, as far as I know, no one's directly tried to look at that. Um, I think we, you know, maybe interesting thing about attention as a form of prediction. So it's an expectation that something's about to happen whether it's in a spatial location or a color or a feature. Um, and it's, it's really not about movement or anything like that. It's just, it's just a type of prediction. And then when we actually get input, we, we uh, sort of, you know, uh, 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 kind of behave based on that prediction. And then you didn't like this idea of <laughs> spatial uh, attention to ground relative. I, don't know, I, didn't say, I, I guess I'm, I, I want to, I would want more, ev more evidence for that. Yeah. Um, um, I just feel, again, I guess it really goes back to this issue is, is this something we're doing really all the time as you proposed or something that it's mostly a sidekick to movement? Yeah. I, don't know. I think it's pretty accepted we're doing this constantly. I, I'm um, surprised because I, I, I well, and, and each of these tasks are very kind of stereotyped, and you have I, to learn them. 
Yeah, but, I think uh, I, I would agree again. I want to agree with you because on the on the feature attention, I totally agree with you on that. Um, but I, I didn't, and I think that's well understood. On the um, the spatial one, I I'm, I don't think I ever read anything that said that or even suggested that. So um, I'm surprised that you think that's pretty well accepted. <laughs> I guess maybe I should read some more about it. I don't know. It, unfortunately, it's hard to answer that without reading a majority of the papers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, guess yeah. I, so, ask, so, I, I guess I could ask. I guess I ask someone. Uh, ju just checking if anything contradicts uh, something that seems uh, feature uh, feature based attention a thousand brains theory uh, seems like there's a super easy way to to get something like that with thousand brains uh, that I'm sure people have thought of uh, it's you think of it as you you're just priming that part of cortex that part the the, the part that's uh, processing this part of your visual field prime it to to see the blue object like uh, activate the blue representation and then so it's much more ready to detect something that's blue yeah is it, are you thinking like through voting mechanisms is that yeah basically or or but, essentially but, but then you have to, your voting has to be directed the way we have it right now the voting is sort of like hey everybody around me this is what i'm seeing no uh, i really i'm saying go ahead and activate some kind of blue sdr in all of your visual cortex essentially or have it be like ready to see that. Oh, and, oh, oh, oh so, yeah, yeah. For the blue one, you're right. That would be a global one, right? You're right. You're saying, yeah. yeah so, so th yeah, that's exactly what I meant by attention is a form of prediction. Uh, that basically you're, you know, maybe you depolarize those uh, cell, uh, not deep, uh, hyper, yeah, depolarize those cells, or uh, you have some some expectation that those, uh, the, you know, the blue things are going to come. You know, some form of. So this yeah. is this is we why can I was, discuss what the exact mechanism might be. This is why I, was, why I was wondering if there was actually you know if this feature attention is very very different than spatial attention. They may be completely different things, and I because you're right that fits in the thousand brain theories very well. A feature attention is yeah we're expecting a blue or expecting a dog or whatever, and everybody's going to be better tuned to find it because of that. But that's a broadcast signal that would go over a broader area of cortex, whereas this idea that you're telling you only look for something over here. That doesn't fit in the voting scheme. At least we don't have a mechanism for that. It doesn't fit in the voting scheme, but it could be a form of prediction. You're predicting a location. Yeah, uh, but again, we have to. We have to. Well, I don't know if you're predicting a location, or I mean, somehow you're telling the brain to be more sensitive to something which is going to happen in one area. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, it, well, it's, an it, it's an, setting up an expectation. Yeah, but it has to be directed someplace, and. Um, I yeah, guess that's yeah. through the thalamus or something like that. But I, I think, again, I, I would argue that those are really, they, they may, it's one level to be similar, like a form of prediction, but I think that mechanistically, they might be completely different. Um, one could be a voting mechanism and one's a specific thalamic uh, routing type of thing. Well, there's, you know, this object-based attention, which I didn't really talk about, which is more sort of, you can think of it as a more sophisticated form of feature-based attention where you're looking for a particular yeah. class of objects. I always thought that was, and that fits in the voting as well. And I always thought, mm -hmm. I always thought the feature and, and object-based attention are really the same. That's They're very I, similar, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, the, dis, the, dis, the really the distinction is it's just different types of features and different, you know. Yeah, I kind of lumped them both in the same category. Yeah. Which again, that fits really well with the um, with thousand brains theory. I mean, you know, you, just, you know, um, at broadcast to everybody we're looking for something mm -hmm. <laughs> everybody's tuned for it um uh, so that makes a lot of sense yeah anyway i'm still sticking this idea that the spatial um uh, attention is a, a completely different sort of beast than the feature object attention uh, but i you know i'm open to be dissuaded <laughs> did anyone disagree with that i think that uh, I Subutai, you see those as quite different feature-based attention and spatial being too much, two very different things. Yeah, that's how I kind of started out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess. Uh, well, there's a different question of are the mechanisms different? Um, well, I think the mechanisms are different, and I, I actually think that they're. I'm not even sure. Yeah, I think they're. they're, they're they may be just completely different classes of things. You once tied to movement um intimately tied to movement and 
the, uh, and that's why I mentioned earlier, you know, when you do covert attention, there's these, there's these signals of movement that are always associated with it. Mm -hmm. When you do spatial attention, it's like, it's like, it's, it's um, what you're doing when you're doing, I get the impression, maybe I read this, when you're doing a spatial attention, what's actually happening is you're, you're, you're trying to create a movement, but forcing the brain not to move. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're about to move, but don't move. <laughs> Pretend you're moving, but I'm not going to let you move. Uh, freeze your eyeballs. You know, and, and so they might be intimately connected together. Um, and, you, and you didn't think so. You think that this covert attention, this kind of spatial covert attention is happening all the time. What was the speed? Well, I, I think it's at least what you said, but I think there's more than that. Okay. What was the uh, speed at which the covert attention occurred? Uh, about 75 to 100 milliseconds. So you can't, you couldn't be doing a hell of a lot of those. No, no, no. Right? It's like maybe, uh, because maybe you, double. Yeah, you might be doing two of those for every movement. It's not like you're going to get like 10 of them in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that would argue a little bit more from my way of thinking that, you know, yes, it's going to be faster than a saccade because um, the whole point is some reason to get this system going before the saccade completes and finishes. Um, but you're not going to be doing a hell of a lot of them. But the, it, it is an intriguing idea that you could flip it around. I, I am not well read on this, but flip it around and say that like the covert attention is actually the main thing that's happening. And over detention is just there to as an extra feature, to, a, a, a extra uh, thing to make covert attention even better. Like it, you can actually even move the eye, but maybe the covert attention is what's at the bottom. Well, I, that, that can only go so far. It's an interesting idea, but obviously you can't go very far just with over uh, covert attention. I can't explore my house. I can't learn what a coffee cup feels like. <laughs> just with go, you know, I, I, if I'm holding a coffee cup in my hand. I can I can attend to what each individual's finger is feeling, but I can't move them around to figure out what the coffee cup shape is. You know, <laughs> so it's kind of limited. Um, I guess just the perspective here is like movement evolved to make covert attention better. Uh, okay, but in the end, you really got to have um, uh, movement to do. The, it's it's not just better. It's it, it, it's dramatically better, a thousand times better. Type of thing. Yeah, well, that's an interesting idea. Well, I think they are tied together. That's I think that's a general theme of that I've read in the past. Can anything be said about the fact that when the uh, in the example where you're asking for multiple cues and it got more complex, that uh, you were just saying that you could only probably do a few of these coverts at a time? I mean, isn't that you know when the scene gets complex enough, you might not be you know. You, you can't rely upon that. You have to start searching at, at that point. So there's yeah, but in in this one you can search without any eye movements. Uh, so okay. in these examples, uh, you know, there's never any eye movements in the in the picture. Right, right. What I'm saying is, but you know, at some point it'll get to the limit of being able to do that, and then you have to do. Uh, I'm just saying, can you set a boundary on how complex a covert hypothesis, how many how many uh, covert hypothesis for movement you could actually entertain at any one time yeah so there's one big uh you know there's clearly an issue of kind of how much resolution there is in different parts of the visual field so the further away you are from uh the point where you're fixated the, mm -hmm. the lower the resolution is going to be so you know if you're fixating at the center here and you and you're looking at something you know way over there uh you're not going to be able to resolve things uh, I, sure. So there's that limitation. But um, I'm, I'm just thinking, uh, tying into Jeff's notion that you know the eye, uh, the muscles start to twitch in, in preparation. It's like I'm thinking there's probably a limit of how many things it could plan against, mm -hmm. you know, at any one time. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it's it's really. I mean, it's hard to not move your eyes. So it's just hard to do it for seconds at a time. <laughs> Even well, monkeys, the monkeys are trained to do this and they're really motivated. I mean, they're thirsty. They're really thirsty and they're really motivated and they've been trained to do this for months. Even they, on any, partic on any particular trial, will screw up and move their eyes a bunch of times. They just, even though they know, they know it's not, it's, there's no reward, they just cannot control themselves. And then they throw those trials away. I'm just I'm wondering if at some point you increase the complexity so that they're unable to actually get the reward because they're unable to do the goal without moving their eye. I'm just wondering if there's a boundary. I, I, there. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. At some point, it just gets just these things will be so close together. You'll need some amount of resolution to do it. Yeah, they they uh, generally, you know, they always kind of keep these at the edge of um, the edge of doable by the animal. Um, because the, the animal needs to get a reward when they do it right, and therefore it has to be hard for them to do it. 
Yeah, you, you don't want to throw them into despair. You don't want to throw them into despair, but you also don't want to make it easy. Because they get easy, then then the whole thing. These these experiments are almost always based on the animal gets you know gets a dopamine reward or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's complex. It's been going on for decades. Anyway, I think we're over our hour, so. All right, that was uh, that was fun. Uh, it was, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a random topic, but uh, yeah, it was you right. know, what the heck? It was good. I'm glad you did it. All right, All right. we'll see you guys again in half an hour. Yep. All right, see you then. Bye. OK. Thanks for watching, everybody. Um, that's all I got. Uh, there will be a stream Friday, I think, just to Twitch, Friday morning at 10, where we'll continue going uh, over Insights from the Brain by Matthew. Um, Monday morning, I will also be streaming to this YouTube channel, um, the Brains at Bay meetup. It's about predictive coding. Um, there's some. There's already over a hundred RSVPs for that, so it uh, should be interesting. Um, that's Avi Pfeiffer and Georg Keller are the speakers. Um, so we got that coming up on the live stream. So uh, stick around. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go follow me on Twitch at Ryolite underscore, or find me on Twitter at Ryolite. Uh, take care, everybody. I am looking for the button that I need to press to stop the stream. There it is.